If you have your Bibles this morning, be looking with us to the book of Ezra, the book of Ezra, chapter number one. And uh, we just wrapped up our Easter season, and we looked, spent almost a month looking at the days and events leading up to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And today we still rejoice today that he's alive. Amen. And so we celebrate as much today as we did last Sunday, and we thank the Lord for his resurrection. And truly blessed is the name of the Lord. Today, as we were, I guess, looking back at the end of last year, we were praying about where we should go after we wrapped up our our series through First Peter, we began to pray about, and um, as a staff, we got together, we worked on a, uh, a series that we want to begin this morning, and we will look at going through for the upcoming weeks and uh, see where the Lord takes us. But this morning, I want to come to the beginning of Ezra chapter 1, and I'm going to read just three verses, and we really want to look at a series as we go through the book of Ezra looking at the concept and the thought of revival, of revival. And we want to look at the heart of revival, the heart of revival, what revival is, what it looks like, and what God can do in our lives. In the book of Ezra, chapter number 1, we are going to read just the first three verses. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled... The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. So they made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among you of all his people. May his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in prayer. And God, we ask that for the next few minutes, Lord, that you would open up our hearts, Lord, to the leadership and the move and work of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would begin to place in the heart of your people a hunger and a desire for true godly revival. Lord, I pray that you would work in our church in our midst. Lord, may you do in our lives as you would see fit. And Lord, we will give you the honor and the glory for which you deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Cyrus, here we find in the passage of scripture, was the king of Persia and was a uh, Uh, one of the most powerful men that have lived, and here he comes, that God began to work in his life that the temple would be rebuilt in Jerusalem. We find that the temple, Solomon's temple, had been destroyed, and for quite some time now, Israel had lived and existed, scattered abroad, and a remnant there in Jerusalem, but there had not been a temple. Cyrus was prophesied in Isaiah Matter of fact, in Isaiah chapter 44 through 26 and 28, it tells us that Cyrus would rebuild the temple. Uh, Isaiah was written sometime around 740 to 701 B.C., and Cyrus ordered the temple to be rebuilt around 539 B.C., so close to 200 years before Ezra comes into place, Isaiah had prophesied that he would rebuild the temple. In Isaiah 44, the Bible says, Who confirms the word of his covenant and performs the counsel of his messenger, who says to Jerusalem, You shall be inhabited. To the cities of Judah you shall be built, and I will raise up her waste places. Who says to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and he shall perform all. All my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. We find that Cyrus was prophesied of Isaiah almost 200 years before Ezra, this book, is written. And here we find the record and the recording of his work. So that brings us to the thought, if if Cyrus was moved by God to rebuild the temple, and how does this have 
what effect does this have with revival? Where are we going with this? Well, Kenneth Boa, uh, I want to read a quote from him. In his book, Conform to His Image, says on dealing with the subjects of renewal and revival. In many cases, spirit-centered renewal movements have brought new life and vitality on a corporate and personal level. But as beneficial as the joy and exuberance can be, this form of renewal is often not the same as revival. And so what he's saying is just to be renewed in our spirits and our mind is not necessarily the full work of revival. In revival, God confronts people through his anointed messengers of his purity and word. And this leads to serious business of repentance, return, and restoration. So we find that there is a difference between just being renewed and true revival. True revival is where God's people are repent of their sins and they return to their first love of loving God, repenting of their sin, and living to please Him. Revivals have spread around throughout our country. Matter of fact, Tennessee, East Tennessee, had revival that came to this area even as far back as during the Civil War. Born Again in the Trenches, Revival in the Armies of Tennessee, a letter written by Clinton Prim Jr., says that revivals occurred throughout much of the history of the armies of Tennessee, despite one historian's claim that they started and stopped in Dalton, Georgia. During the winter of 1863 to the spring of 1864, this spiritual outpouring reached its pinnacle in the army of Tennessee as chaplains united and thousands were converted and baptized. They would go on to talk about how throughout that, that the gambling and the drinking and, and the carousing all would come to a stop. When true revival came through, there was a change in the life of the peoples who had been revived. So today I would ask, what is revival? Strictly speaking, revival itself, and you're probably familiar with the subject of revival, but strictly speaking, revival is not really mentioned in the New Testament. It's an Old Testament concept that, uh, that that the idea is carried forth in the New Testament, but revival itself is not mentioned in the New Testament. In Genesis chapter 45, verse number 27, we see the first account of revival in the Bible. And here it says, But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. What we find here in this passage of Scripture, in the first instance of revival, is that um, Jacob was revived in his spirit, that where death was, life came in, where he had given up, where he was just worn out, where he had just kind of sat down and was through and finished with life. He said, it's all over. Uh, We're kind of past where we need to be. And we find that when he heard this news, that his spirit was revived, he was reinvigorated with life, and he said, listen, I have purpose to live for. I have meaning and I'm going to carry forth with my life. His spirit was revived. Revival is found in the Bible is not an emotional experience, but rather a renewal of life. That's what revival is. It's to be revived. Now, we understand in scripture that uh, that some of the concepts and some of the after effects of revival is that people will come to know Jesus Christ. But even revival itself is not just people getting saved because you can't breathe life into something that never had life to start with. Revival is for the Christian, for the believer who comes to a place where they repent of their sin and come back to a place in their walk with God where they say, Lord, we're going to recognize and admit that we are sinners and we're going to repent from that and instead we're going to follow you. It is have a purpose. And listen, Lord, we understand that in spite of conflict and difficulties that there is a cause, there is a reason because Christ revives up our spirit and brings us to a place of desire to live from him. So here we find this is what's transpiring in the book of Ezra. Revival is about to take place in its truest sense because Israel has been, uh, the temple had been destroyed, the people had been living in bondage, they were scattered abroad, and all of a sudden now they are being restored to life, the temple is being rebuilt, the people are invigorated, they repent of their sins, and they get back to following God and doing what he has called them to do. Ezra is the account 
a revival. And so what I want to look at as we begin this series, as we go through this, is I want to examine Ezra. And and now we understand this is the Old Testament, we are the New Testament. But yet still through that we can see how God works and how God moves and the means by which God revives his people. Here in this passage of scripture, what we find is, is that revival must come from God. It must come from God. It cannot come from you and I. Our church stands in desperate need of revival. I'm not talking about a revival meeting. We've had revival meetings and we've seen God work. I'm not talking about a meeting. I'm talking about true revival where we repent of our sins, get our hearts right with God, and get back to a place where we say, listen, God, we want to serve you above all else. That's what we stand in need of today. The church as general needs this. But North Etowah Baptist Church needs revival. So what does this look like? We must understand that it must come from God. In this passage of Scripture, we find that the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. God stirred it up. This word stirred up literally means to agitate or it really comes from the place of being set on fire. We talk about revival fire. This is where it comes from, this word agitate, to set on fire, to to, to be consumed with. And so the Bible says here that God stirred up the heart of Cyrus. Now, it, it really this word to be set on fire... Um, It comes from the root word that gives the idea of passionate desire. Almost that is what you would expect of a hormonal young teenager. It's a burning to be set on fire, a burning desire that consumes to the point where all you can think about, all you can meditate upon is this one idea, this one thought. And the Bible says that God stirred up the heart of Cyrus. Now, many historians will try to say, listen, uh, Cyrus was a a genius when it comes to conquering and combat. And he he had great power. And and the Persians, they believed in letting the people have their own religion. And so he was trying to build the temple up just to keep the Israelites at peace so there would be peace among his kingdoms. The only problem with that concept is that's not what God said what happened. God said that he stirred up the heart of Cyrus. That God gave a desire in him for revival. That the temple would be restored. And so we find that this is what happened. God was the one who brought Cyrus to a place and said, Cyrus... The temple in Jerusalem must be rebuilt. Cyrus was not a Jew. He had no personal investment for a temple to be rebuilt. Other than God began to speak to his heart and say, Cyrus... My temple needs to be rebuilt, and you're going to do it. God was the instigator of revival. But the second thing we hear is that God stirred up his heart. In Isaiah chapter 45, verses 1 through 7, the Bible says, Thus said the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings to open before him the double door so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. Again, he wasn't a Christian. He wasn't a follower of Christ. God said, you don't even know me, but I know you, and I've called you by name. 
I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you that you have not known me. That they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. The Lord stirred up his heart, but then God began to move and work in the heart of Cyrus. Saying, listen, Cyrus, you don't know me. You haven't known me, but I've known you. And I've got a work for you to do. What we find with revival is that it must come from God. It must be that God that does a stirring. But it must begin God working in our hearts. Revival, if it does not affect the heart, is not revival at all. We find that Revival must come from God. There is a second thing that I would like to look at, and that is this, that God is not limited to us. God is not limited to us when it comes to this thing of revival. Sometimes we look at revival, I would dare say not even more than sometimes, most of the time, and for many all the time, we look at revival and say, God, here's what I have, take and use it, do with this what you will. And God sometimes may say, what you have is not what I'm wanting to use, I'm wanting to use something else. The Israelites do not think for a moment that they did not want the temple to be rebuilt or restored. They did. I'm sure they prayed for it. They asked for it. They desired and and, and dreamed that the temple would be restored to its beauty and majesty that it was under Solomon. And the whole time, what happened? Nothing. And then God stirred the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia. Someone from the outside who did not even know their God, who didn't know anything about them. He was just a king in a far off land. But God stirred up his heart and God said, Cyrus, through you, I want to restore what I have in Jerusalem. Now, I I imagine... I'm thankful that they were who they were because had they have been modern day Baptists, we would have said, well, too bad, Cyrus, I'm glad you've got a desire, but you're not going to work here. (laughs) Because we don't know you. But God's not limited to us. God will use whoever, whenever, however he so desires and either will work as he wants to or we're going to miss out on his blessings. We do not get to put God in a box even though often we want him to work with inside our little box, don't we? But that's not the way God is. So God's not limited to us. What we see here is that God used someone with ability. God used someone with ability and then made the way possible and blessed his efforts. As we read in Isaiah, he was king of Persia. He had all of the resources that were necessary. But in spite of that, in Isaiah, God still said, listen, I'm going to make his way straight. I'm going to provide for him. I'm going to give provisions, the crooked ways I'm going to make straight. God said he may have abilities, he may have provisions. But God said even through that, I'm going to bless because I want to use him for my work. God is not limited to you and I. And here God said, listen, you may not have the resources. Israel, you may not have the ability to rebuild the temple. You may have the desire, but the ability to do that may be beyond you. No matter how well your intentions are. God says, but there is someone who can. 
And I'm going to stir up their heart. And I'm going to use and work in a ways that are above and beyond you. God used someone with ability. And then God used someone who was willing. God used someone who was ability. There are a lot of people that had ability. But Cyrus was the only one that obeyed God. And God used him because he was willing to follow James chapter 1, verse number 22, the Bible says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. God is looking for someone who is willing to say, Lord, I'm just going to follow you. I wonder this morning, are we willing to follow God? It's awful quiet in here this morning. Are you willing to follow God? A couple of you are. See, we say we'll follow God. But what about when it's difficult? What about when it's challenging? What about when it goes against our traditions or when it goes against our desires God says do not be hearers only but be doers and God said listen I want to work I want to rebuild my temple and I'm going to use someone from the outside to do it he said but you're going to have to be willing to do And if God is going to send revival, we must come to the realization that God is not limited to us, but he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And as old preacher said, and he owns all the taters in the hills. His ability, his provisions, his resources, they're so much greater than what we have. But are we willing to allow him to move? We cannot put God in a box. We can't place him in a box. Oftentimes, and I'm guilty of it, and if you're honest with yourself, you're guilty of it too. What we say is, God, here's what I want You can work all that you desire as long as you work within the confines of my box that I have created for you. And you may not want to admit it this morning, but you're as guilty of it as I am. We say, Lord, here it is. You work right here. And God may be saying, listen, I want to work so much more than you could ever imagine. Now listen, I'm not talking about getting away from the word of God. This right here is unmovable. This is our foundation. And the first time this isn't the foundation of our church, I'll be gone. And the first time this isn't the the foundation of this pulpit and the preaching, uh, you run me off. This is unchangeable. This is not negotiable. But often what I'm talking about is we put boundaries far, far different than what the Word of God said. We take the Word of God and then inside of the Word of God we begin to interject all of our little petty opinions Our, our personal desires. What someone else down the street does. And we began to place God in a box. And God saying, listen, I want to use Cyrus, king of Persia, to do something remarkable like you can't even imagine. God said, just let me work. We cannot place God in a box For three reasons this morning. One, 
God may work where we cannot. He may work where we cannot. Where we desire and don't have the ability, God may say, listen, I've got the means, I'm ready to work. I'll work where you cannot if you'll just let me work. Then God may work where we have not. There may be areas in our church, our lives, our, our ministry where we, we don't even recognize that there's a need for, for God to move. And God may say, listen, if you'll just get rid of the box, stand upon the foundation of my word and get out of my way and let me move. God may say, listen, I'm going to work where you don't even have an idea that I'm able to do something. I'll work where you have not. And then thirdly, God will work where we will not. There are some things that, in spite of our intentions, we just won't do. Why? Because we lacked faith. We lack vision. We lack obedience. We lack courage. And God says, listen. If you'll stay faithful, you stay faithful. You keep obeying me. You keep following me. And God says, listen, I'll work where you cannot, where you have not, and where you will not. And God is able to restore that means to bring a life, to breathe life back into, to cause us to repent. Now, this morning, we have to be willing to repent. If we want God to revive our church and revive our community, we must be willing to repent. That means we must come to a place where we are willing to swallow our pride and say, I was wrong. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then we repent. We'll find that our fellowship with Him, our walk with Him is restored. And then our hearts and our vigor are renewed. And then we'll experience revival. That's what revival is. Listen, I grew up in the churches where we'd have meetings and we'd shout and run the aisles. And I mean, I'm telling you, they, some, of those, some of those revival meetings, they'd get, uh, they'd get carried away. We were in a meeting here a few years ago. I'm going to tell you what Maggie said. She was just a little girl. We were in a meeting and they were shouting and hooping and hollering. And uh, we got there and we got out of the car. And I said, Maggie, I said, when we get back to church Sunday, are you going to shout like that for Daddy? When he was preaching, she went, Daddy, I would never disrespect Jesus like that. I thought, oh, me. <laughs> out of the mouths of babes. <laughs> a lot of times, if we're not careful, we'll, we'll equate emotional reactionism to revival and that is not revival revival is where we repent of our sins and turn to God and obey him that's the kind of revival we need and God is able to do it just as he did through Cyrus a man from the outside looking in who had no personal investment other than God had spoke to his heart and said, I want my temple to be rebuilt. And through him, as we'll look over the next several weeks, God began to work and move. And God did through and in them what they never could have by themselves. That's what we need this morning. But are we willing to allow God to work? in our church are we willing that's a question that each of us must answer for ourselves and collectively we'll have to make the choice either God will allow you to work 
God, I'll be willing to repent of my sins and place you above all else. And until that moment, until that moment, just like Israel for hundreds of years, they went through the emotions without the blessings and presence of God in their midst. God will allow us to work without Him. But where's the joy in that? Where's the blessings in that? The heart of revival. This morning, God desires to work and move. But are we willing to obey, repent, and follow him. Every head bowed, every eye closed. As Aaron comes and begins to play this morning, I wonder who it is that's here today. Maybe you're here. And I know our men on Tuesday mornings have been praying for God to do something at this church for over 20 years. And like clockwork, they're faithful every Tuesday to pray. This morning, I wonder if God were to send Cyrus to work, would we be willing? Would we be willing to allow God to move regardless? This morning, if that's you. You said, Pastor, I want God to revive our church. I want God to move. We've been praying for it. Pastor, I want God to move. We need God. I want to ask you this morning as he plays, the altar is open. Why why don't you come and pray this morning? Why don't you come to the altar and say, God, would you revive our church once more? How about it this morning, church? Would you come and pray? that God would revive our hearts once more.